Today we've got Richard Bush. You've got his bio, so I, I don't want to repeat what's in it. You, know, you know, all know he's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He's director of its Center for Northeast Asian Policy Studies. If you have not read this book, and this is somebody, I am someone who, I guess the American public thinks I know a lot about Taiwan. <coughs> And I spent a lot of time living on Taiwan, and I worked in the State Department in the 70s, but I learned an enormous amount from this book. And I am hard-pressed to think about anything that has been written that informs us more about cross-strait relations than this book. It is really, it is a terrific read. It made my weekend actually a lot more fun given the weather in New York than it would have been otherwise. Um, and it's worth it. But Richard, we are thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for coming up from Washington. And thank you for being an expert on something so important to the United States. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Steve, uh, for those kind words. Um, your staff says that you don't usually praise authors. Uh, like that, so it's uh, doubly and triply valuable to me. I uh, want to thank uh, Steve and Jan Barris for making this possible, and uh, thank Margot Landman for um, her heroic efforts to make sure I got up here, and uh, even more heroic to make sure I get back to Washington tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about um, um, some of the findings of my book. Uh, I appreciate your interest. And uh, I'll hang around to sign copies uh, if you're um, willing to buy them. Uh, the announcement that you received used the word uh, surprising to talk about uh, what has happened in cross-strait relations um, in uh, the last five years, since 2008. I think that's an appropriate word. Um, and uh, surprising is used in a good way. Good for Taiwan, good for China, and good for the United States. Um, frankly, we have few good news stories uh, around these days. I mean, in East Asia, you have North Korea, the East China Sea, the South China Sea, uh, Middle East, you have Iran and Syria, and uh, at home, or at least in Washington, we have our budget woes. So um, um, this is uh, uh, something positive that's happened, and. Uh, uh, therefore, it doesn't get a lot of attention, and uh, that was one of the reasons that I uh, decided to write Uncharted Strait. Um, so I, to appreciate why this is surprising, I think it's important to go back briefly uh, to talk about the um, trends before 2008, uh, before um, Taiwan's president, Ma ying was first uh, sworn into office. Um, then review what's happened in the last five years, and uh, then to look forward. Uh, my own estimate, and it's, all, uh, it's only that, is that um, the situation we're going to see going forward is different from what we've had in the last five years, um, but it's not too bad. Um, so briefly, um, from the mid-1990s mid -1990s to 2008, uh, there was a situation between the two sides of the strait of deepening mutual fear. Each side uh, was afraid that the other was going to challenge its fundamental interests. China, of course, um, um, uh, has as its long-term goal the unification of Taiwan um, with China, uh, and it thought in the early 90s that uh, the chances of that happening uh, were growing. Um, at the same time, Taiwan was in the process of becoming a full democracy, and that freed uh, um, people to say things that they'd never been allowed to say before, including the words Taiwan independence. Uh, it uh, really broadened and complicated the debate uh, within Taiwan. Um, and uh, because of this flowering of opinions, there was resistance um, on the island to um, what uh, Beijing wanted. Um, so increasingly, each side mistrusted the motives of the other. Each took steps uh, in its own way to protect its interest, um, and that then led the other to be even more worried about where things were going. And so you had a kind of 
uh, vicious circle. Um, the United States was growing more fearful. Um, we want to have good relations with uh, uh, both sides, uh, but we could see uh, the possibility that uh, in this climate of deepening mistrust that through accident, through miscalculation, uh, the two sides could uh, slide into some kind of conflict which then might evolve, involve the United States. And scholars at the time were saying um, Taiwan is the only situation that could lead to a war between the United States and, the, and uh, China. Um, I don't think that's true anymore, and I think North Korea has uh, jumped to the top of the list. Um, and I hope it doesn't happen, but one can see how it might happen. Um, I was part of the diplomacy during some of this time in, in trying to keep the situation under control. Um, there was an episode in 1999 uh, where I came as close as I'll ever come to becoming a celebrity. Um, President Lee Dong Wei, out of the blue, said something about cross-strait relations that got um, both China very upset and um, um, the United States. And so I was the one who drew the short straw and was sent to Taiwan to complain. Um, and um, uh, the media was relentless in trying to track me down. Um, I stayed uh, that time at the residence of our deputy director at the American Institute in Taiwan, Steve Young, who's now Consul General in Hong Kong. Um, and um, when we got up uh, the first morning and looked out into his backyard to the wall that goes uh, uh, around his residence, there was a cameraman up on the top of the wall shooting into the dining room. Fortunately, we were both dressed. Uh, and, you know, they followed me everywhere. Um, and, um, you know, the situation worked out okay, but it was one of the steps in this downward spiral. So that's the background. Um, this, the situation continued when Chen Shui-bian was president, and uh, uh, during the election campaign leading up to 2000, the 2008 elections, there was, again, uh, quite a bit of concern. Starting around 2004, 2005, in the middle of this, Beijing and forces in Taiwan uh, started repositioning themselves, and the United States did too. And this began to create a context for a different situation, if there was political will all around. Um, China's message here, its, its repositioning was, first of all, to shift the goal from unification to blocking Taiwan independence which is a, a shorter term goal. Uh, it also made very clear that Taiwan's actions have consequences. And if Taiwan chose a certain path, cross-strait relations could um, get much better. That was an important message for uh, China to put forward. Um, the United States uh, put out the message that um, there were limits uh, to uh, U.S. support of Taiwan, and that um, uh, Taiwan's actions could uh, increase those limits. Um, within Taiwan, in the Kuomintang, um, there was um, a new approach and a couple of very important initiatives. Um, in 2005, uh, the then uh, party chairman, Lian Zhan, former vice president, um, uh, with uh, some degree of courage, went to Beijing and at a meeting with Hu Jintao, they put forward a, um, a joint statement that outlined how Taiwan policy would change if the Kuomintang returned to power. Um, parallel to this, uh, Ma ying in his campaign for president, which was already beginning, um, said, we have a different path. Uh, we can better secure our prosperity, our security, our dignity, our freedom by engaging China rather than provoking it. 
Um, and um, as a result, in the 2008 election, uh, Ma Ying Zhou won very easily over the candidate of the Democratic Progressive Party, Frank Xie. Um, the public was unhappy with eight years of DPP rule. Uh, the economy uh, could have been better, and uh, people were just tired of the uncertainty. Um, <clears throat> I give a lot of credit in all of this to Hu Jintao and Ma Ying Zhou, uh, because I think they're the ones that um, took the risks for a better relationship, um, and it paid off. So um, let me turn to Ma Ying Zhou's first term, which ran from 2008 to 2012, and Hu Jintao's second term, if you will. Um, I need to clarify what wasn't happening. Um, this was not the deliberate beginning steps uh, towards unification. Ma had actually ruled out unification and independence uh, during the time that he was president. What was occurring was the stabilization of cross-strait relations, making them more predictable in a positive way, more cooperative, more institutionalized. Um, and uh, that is essentially what has happened. Uh, this required a, a certain amount of sleight of hand in order to get the process started. Um, Ma Ying Zhou said, we uh, accept um, um, the 1992 consensus. I'm not going to go into the theology of the 1992 consensus. Um, it will put you to sleep. Um, and it's not a total consensus. Uh, there, there's areas of overlap, but areas of difference. But it was good enough for the political purposes of the two sides. And that's where we are today. So um, Beijing and Taipei focused on the more easy issues, uh, mainly economic ones. Um, they uh, normalized economic relations, first of all. So for example, you no longer had to spend your whole day traveling from one side of the strait to the other. Uh, and going through Hong Kong or Macau in the process, which was Taiwan's rules, you could now uh, get a nonstop from downtown Taipei to um, um, Shanghai and, um, or wherever you were going, and it saved a lot of time, and it meant that Taiwan businessmen could go home on the weekend and spend time with their families. Um, the two sides liberalized their economic relationship, uh, they signed in 2010 called something, something called the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement. Um, this was um, um, sort of movement uh, towards a free trade area. Uh, there was the initial framework agreement itself. There were five other agreements promised uh, that included um, um, lip Excuse me? I didn't tell people to turn out their cell phone. I don't know what that is. It's an 800 call. Sorry. Um, and, um, but this is part of a, a series of 18 agreements uh, that um, put cross-strait relations on a much better basis. Um, they, the two sides, um, exploited common interests in non-economic areas, particularly one having to do with crime and judicial assistance, uh, which has paid dividends to both sides. The situation is not perfect. Ma had political problems because of what was happening in the global economy and other things. His approval ratings throughout his first term were pretty low. Um, he got a lot of um, criticism uh, from the Democratic Pro Progressive Party and others about his engagement with uh, the island, with, with China. They said he had undermined Taiwan's sovereignty. I think that's a bum rap. Um, the, the more difficult charge was that um, economic relations with China were increasing inequality on, on Taiwan. And the, the PRC military buildup continued. Now, that had started um, around 1999 to deter Taiwan independence. Now you had a Taiwan president who said, we're not going to do independence as long as I'm president. Um, so why did the buildup continue? I think there are a variety of answers. Uh, one of them probably is China was afraid of 
the DPP returning to power in 2012. But that didn't happen. Uh, when it came to the election uh, in January last year, um, Ma won a comfortable victory, not as um, easy as had been the case in 2008, um, but that wasn't to be expected. Um, he won, I think, um, mainly because he made cross-strait relations mm -hmm. the most salient, is salient issue in the campaign. He said, if you like what's been happening, if you think it's good for Taiwan, you have to vote for me because it's not going to continue if you vote for my opponent. Um, the United States and China uh, also sought to make uh, cross-strait relations the most salient um, um, issue. At this point, I think, looking at the results of the election, that the balance of sentiment on the island um, is about 55 percent of the populace is comfortable with the direction that, that President Ma has taken. 45 percent is either skeptical or downright opposed. Um, that's um, not bad uh, for such a complicated issue um, and one that uh, has implications for Taiwan's long-term future. Uh, but it means that Taiwan's still a divided society. Um, uh, in the election campaign, Beijing tried to do some things uh, uh, to help Ma uh, and to help itself. One of the most interesting was that it um, um, created economic incentives for farmers in the southern part of Taiwan. South, the southern part of Taiwan is the DPP stronghold. It's where they always do well. Um, so, for example, um, there's a little town called Shuja, and they produce milkfish, which are very popular on the mainland. So uh, um, Beijing made it possible for some good contracts for the uh, fish farmers in Shuja. And um, uh, this was interesting. Political scientists in Taiwan wanted to find out what happened as a result of these incentives. Um, they discovered that the support rate for the DPP in that area was essentially the same as it had been before. Uh, so the fish farmers were, were taking the incentives, but then they were voting the way they always did. Uh, then the intensity of their vote may have declined. I mean, it does suggest that uh, Taiwan voters can, can operate with two sides of their brain, the, the economic side and the political side. Um, and, but um, uh, that's politics. So. Um, so far, so good. Uh, this is the, the positive story so far. Um, but Taiwan's still a divided society. What's going to happen in Ma's second term, which began last May, and Xi Jinping's first term, if you will? Um, I think that um, for a couple of reasons, uh, the momentum of cross-strait relations is going to slow. Um, this is to be expected, um, I think, first of all, because uh, Taiwan is divided on this issue. Um, I think it's also true that most of the easy, easy issues have been tackled already. There's still some economic issues and cultural issues that uh, uh, can be done, and uh, there's probably mutual benefit for the two sides to gain from that. Uh, it's very important, I think, that the agreements that have already been reached are implemented well, because that will be an investment for the future. Um, China has expressed an interest, or some Chinese have expressed an interest in moving um, towards uh, political issues and security issues. Um, I think that's still problematic. Um, uh, the evidence suggests that the Taiwan public is not ready to go there yet. I'm not saying they won't be willing at some point in the future, but right now uh, there's a lot of nervousness uh, about this. Um, whether it comes to some kind of political framework agreement or a peace accord, um, and perhaps we can talk about why in the question period. Um, fortunately, from what I've been able to detect, um, China is pretty patient about this situation. 
um, the um, declaratory policy that's come out of the National Party Congress and the National People's Congress uh, suggests that uh, the focus is still on, on quote-unquote peaceful development, which is really what I mean by stabilization. Uh, I think there's an understanding on the part of Taiwan's, uh, of China's Taiwan policy managers that uh, Beijing cannot push Taiwan faster than Taiwan is willing to go. Um, that may mean that Taiwan doesn't get everything it wants, uh, but it means that um, it won't be forced to make really uh, tough choices um, before uh, the foundation has been laid. Uh, there's a bigger underlying problem uh, that is obstructing po uh, progress, and that is um, what's the legal status of, of Taiwan and the government in Taiwan? Is it a sovereign entity for purposes of uh, the international system, for cross-strait relations, for the political system in Taiwan, or is it not? Um, I tend to feel that... Um, one country, two systems, China's formula for Taiwan and Hong Kong and Macau is not consistent with Taiwan's vision of itself. Um, and so one country, two systems has never uh, been terribly popular. Um, I'm not so concerned about what's going to happen in the near term. Um, I expect until the end of Ma's second term. Um, there will be modest product progress, I expect. President Ma is setting uh, pretty low expectations. He believes that um, the best way to preserve peace and stability is to give Beijing um, a strong stake in, um, in peace. Uh, and as I say, China seems patient. Um, the question is what happens uh, later? What happens, for example, if the DPP comes back to power in 2016 or 2020? Uh, I think that there will be an, init an initial reaction in China of anxiety and frustration that um, um, uh, there's been this reversal. On the other hand, I think that, that Beijing learned from 2000 to 2008 uh, that it had a lot of tools uh, to cope with the DPP administration and, and contain any provocative initiatives uh, that might, uh, might occur. I mean, one of those tools is to come to us uh, and get the United States administration to um, urge restraint on Taiwan. Uh, I think, actually, uh, Taiwan's democracy has become a check on um, really serious provocations. So I hope that if the DPP does come back to power, that common sense uh, and patience will continue to prevail in Beijing. I mean, the, the relationship will be different um, um, for a variety of reasons, but uh, it need not be terrible. Uh, the, the more complicated question is what happens if China becomes impatient with the KMT administration uh, and, and believes that the incremental progress that it's been willing to accept is not getting it any closer, really, uh, to its fundamental goal of unification. We already have some, some complaints from scholars about uh, President Ma's intentions. Um, I think that um, if Beijing sticks with the content of uh, one country, two systems, um, uh, things uh, will be stuck. Um, I think there's a danger in those circumstances that Beijing will no longer be willing to um, um, continue its current approach of, of mutual and gentle persuasion of Taiwan but, and shift to um, um, more intimidation and pressure. And... Um, um, push Taiwan to accept uh, an agreement that it's not ready to. Uh, you see a hint of this already. Um, uh, the prominent Taiwan scholar in Shanghai, a scholar of Taiwan studies, wrote um, recently, the severe, severe asymmetrical balance of power between mainland China and Taiwan is a fact that no one can change. 
Moreover, this problem will continue to increase, a situation that Taiwan needs to handle pragmatically and calmly. We can imagine what he probably means by pragmatically and calmly. Um, I hope that this uh, doesn't happen, um, but I can't rule it out. Um, I think there are things that Taiwan can do to um, improve its own situation, strengthen itself um, economically by enhancing its global economic competitiveness, um, maintaining a good relationship with the United States, um, having a better understanding of what it means to say that the Republic of China is an in independent sovereign state and um, uh, enhance its military capabilities in a smart way. Now, what does all this mean for the United States? And uh, I'll just talk for a couple more minutes. Um, after Ma's inauguration in 2008, um, he received a letter from Senator Barack Obama. And the letter made three points. Number one, um, Senator Obama praised uh, Ma's uh, proposed policies towards the mainland. Two, he hoped uh, that um, the mainland respond, would respond. And three, that based on um, uh, President Ma's policies, U.S.-Taiwan relations would improve. Implicitly, there's a linkage, not so implicitly, there's a linkage between Taiwan's cross-strait policies and U.S.-Taiwan uh, relations. Um, I think the Obama administration has acted on that promise. Um, the conduct of our relations um, uh, is in very good shape. Um, the United States authorized Taiwan for the visa waiver program, which is very good for the average Taiwan citizen who wants to come to the United States. You don't have to stand in line. You don't have to pay an outrageous fee. Um, uh, the Obama administration approved uh, two major arms sales packages. And after um, a lot of difficulties over market access for American beef, um, the trade and investment framework agreement talks uh, have resumed uh, just last week. Um, I think that uh, particularly economically, um, there are ways the United States can help Taiwan strengthen itself. Uh, and uh, preserve its economic competitiveness. Um, I think that certain kinds of arms sales um, are appropriate. Um, Taiwan does uh, have to ask the question, in uh, uh, a deteriorating security environment, what's the best defense strategy uh, for maintaining deterrence? Uh, and what um, weapons does it need for that? What platforms does it need? And what can uh, the United States uh, best help with? Uh, I think this is a very uh, important question. Uh, I think that um, a statement um, about a year and a half ago by a Pentagon official was very telling. Uh, he said publicly, lasting security for Taiwan cannot be achieved simply by purchasing limited numbers of advanced weapon systems. Um, Taiwan must also devote greater attention to asymmetric concepts and technologies to maximize Taiwan's enduring strategic, enduring strengths and advantages. Uh, I think there's a lot uh, packed into that statement, and uh, um, I think uh, Taiwan has tried to take it seriously. Um, so, uh, to sum up. The situation today is a whole lot better uh, than it was five years ago, um, and perhaps better than any side uh, expected. Um, it's far from perfect, um, but uh, it's good for all three sides, um, in, including uh, the United States. Um, for um, Beijing and Taipei, um, they've made good progress uh, where possible and where there's mutual benefit. Um, the easy stuff um, is pretty much done. Um, to do the hard things uh, requires work on both sides. Um, Taiwan has things to do to keep itself relatively strong. Finally, I'd, I'd make an observation about Taiwan's democracy. Um, there was a lot of 
unhappiness and skepticism uh, in the late 90s and uh, the early part of the last decade about how Taiwan's democracy had um, evolved. And um, the, there were people in China who felt that um, Taiwan's, some of Taiwan's politicians were um, engaging in essentially dem dem uh, demagogy, uh, exploiting things like Taiwan identity for their own personal political goals and uh, contrary to the um, basic interests of the Taiwan public. I think the last two elections, two presidential elections, have, uh, have demonstrated that even if that was the case, uh, the public uh, has had the final say. And um, a decent majority of the public <coughs> has agreed that um, the best way uh, to preserve peace and prosperity is to engage China, not to provoke it. Thank you very much. Which I think was covered in previous books, but you did not spend much time on the Li Donghui visit to the United States and how much that changed the way China thinks about cross-strait relations and thinks about the um, uh, the United States role. So if you want to just give the audience kind of a 30-second description of what happened and what the lessons are from that. Um, um, briefly, um, Li Denghui was running for um, um, election in 1996. This was the first time there'd be a direct election in Taiwan. Um, he um, played up Taiwan identity as a um, uh, as a public appeal. Um, he was trying to pull um, DPP supporters to his side, um, and he thought that one way to um, uh, get further public support was to do a trip to the United States. And uh, he mounted uh, a major lobbying campaign. Uh, I saw the results of that in the final days of my time on Capitol Hill. Uh, it was the most impressive lobbying operation I'd ever seen. Um, and um, uh, this really frightened China because it felt that um, it was losing control of the Taiwan issue, that uh, if the United States uh, allowed Li, then others were going to uh, have him as well, like Japan, countries in Western Europe. It interpreted um, his um, visit diplomacy and things he was saying about cross-strait relations as evidence that he, he was really pursuing uh, uh, de jure independence for Taiwan. And uh, so it decided that it had to draw a line, both vis-a-vis -vis Li Dunhui and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. So there it dispatched, uh, it, it fired um, missiles near Taiwan as, as part of uh, some tests. There were other exercises that took place that were threatening. Uh, the United States felt that it had to respond uh, uh, to deter the situation from getting worse. Um, Nobody won, I think, in that uh, little episode. Um, but that um, set uh, a ceiling for a while on Chinese expectations about Li and, uh, and Chen Shui-bian after him. And it's only the last five years that um, they gain greater confidence that they have control of the issue again. What about the claim that that's when the Chinese arms buildup began? Um, I think it was um, beginning then, but I think it was more became more serious after the 1999 episode um, because that wasn't a question of international travel. That was a response to um, something that Li Dong Wei had said that they interpreted as as maybe leading towards a declaration of independence. You say that the, um, the real drag on further progress is the people of Taiwan believe that the status quo is perfectly acceptable. Uh, 
and that they're not ready for a peace agreement or further you know, political progress. The, what, what do you say to those who argue that if President Nixon had waited for the American people to be ready to open relations with China, they still wouldn't be open? And is that really what President Ma or some subsequent president of Taiwan needs to do, which is just show the people that this is in their interest? Well, President Nixon had an advantage in that episode, and that was that he could operate in just about total secrecy. Um, nobody knew um, uh, this was going on. Uh, even people on Kissinger's plane in July of 1979, some of the people on the plane didn't know he was going to China. Um, uh, it was quite impressive. Uh, it's very hard for anything in the Taiwan government to remain secret uh, for very long. Um, this um, is probably a situation where um, um, leaders can educate the public, where experience can educate the public. Um, there is a generational transition going on um, in Taiwan, particularly among what we call the native Taiwanese, people whose families uh, have lived there for many generations. Um, the people who are most hostile to China, most in favor of Taiwan independence, tend to be older um, because of the experiences they lived, to, lived through. People who came to political consciousness after 1985, when economic relations opened, when Taiwan became a democracy, they're far more pragmatic. And um, um, so the old people who feel strongly about these issues are going to pass from the scene. Uh, I think that um, the, the polling that uh, says that um, People in Taiwan want the status quo, and uh, that a very small share wants unification. Um, uh, I don't put too much stock in these polls because it's um, it's very simple questions, uh, and people can answer in ways that um, you know that they define, but it, it, what they mean is not clear. Um, it suggests that if China were to um, at least creatively reinterpret one country, two systems in ways that might be more appealing uh, to the Taiwan public. Who knows how they re would respond? But haven't they, al haven't they already done that? That the, the, what they're offering to Taiwan does not look like the one country, two systems that was offered to, that was given to mm -hmm. Hong Kong. Well, um, there are its own foreign policy. Not having any—I mean, the PLA has barracks in Hong Kong. They've stated that there would be no PLA troops on Taiwan. They stated that Taiwan would continue its own defense. Um, a lot of that, a lot of those pledges were made twenty, more than twenty, 20 years ago. Um, you know, I'd They're operating under the 92 consensus. Well, 20 years ago. Um, the 92 consensus, I think, doesn't uh, address you know, Taiwan's status within a one China. Um, I'm not saying that these um, that these issues can't um, be addressed in a proper context. Um, I expect that. Um, when Taiwan people say they're opposed to one country, two systems, it's um, by habit and rote. Can't rule out um, a different view. Um, but I, I, I do think that um, at this point, um, the issue of the ROC, to put it simplistically, is, is the obstacle. Um, I do think there, there are some very thoughtful scholars in China who understand this and have said this publicly and more power to them. Um, you know, there are smart and creative people on both sides um, and um, um, perhaps they will be smart and wise enough to um, sort of figure out a way to um, bridge the gaps here. Mm -hmm. What I've never understood, this will be my last question because then I'll open it up to the floor. What I've never understood is 
where they're trying to build confidence in the people of Taiwan, why they don't just unilaterally withdraw missiles from Fujian and other kind of areas that are close to Taiwan, because there's really little benefit that's, that's attained from keeping those missiles there. Why not unilaterally do it? What's, who, why is the constituency that says, this is bad, we can't do it? Because they could put them back if yeah. things change. Well, um, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, I've actually made this suggestion myself. So have I. And uh, I think the time for them to have done so was on May 20th, 2008, when President Mao was sworn in. The psychological impact of that um, would have been tremendous. Um, I think at this point, uh, Taiwan is already discounted. Um, the goodwill factor in that gesture because people in Taiwan now know that these missiles are mobile. What can be moved away can be moved back. Um, uh, I, would, I would prefer that China say um, we have suspended, not canceled, but suspended the production and deployment of new ballistical, ballistic mi missiles that can range Taiwan. Um, I think that uh, that would make an impression. Um, I suspect that the reason that that offer or something like it is not made has to do with the relationship between civilian party leaders and generals. And uh, um, that's a subject that we don't really understand, and I, it's just a guess on my part. Hmm. Let me open the floor. Carl? Yes, I love your work. And my question is uh, just what would be this? Oh, sorry. <coughs> Carl Minzner, uh, Fordham Law School professor. Um, what would be the impact, or what would be the likely impact on cross strait relations of a degradation in mainland Japan or mainland? Vietnam relations, you, you end up with a more significant stress, possible clash over the Diaoyu Islands, over the South China Sea, nationalist surge in China linked to sort of military, you know, m posturing and the like. What does that do to cross-strait relations? Does it, does it uh, just repel the Taiwanese away from the mainland? Or do, is, there, is there a strand within Taiwan who might find this sort of attractive, a reassertion of Chinese nationalism? What would happen? Um, it's a good question. The, the answer is um, um, there, there are two sides to it. And um, on the one hand, if the territories or landforms in question are ones that are claimed by the Republic of China for China, then it, at least for part of the public, it gets the nationalistic juices going. And um, there are some people in Taiwan who um, know the history of the Diao um, um quite well. Um, on the other hand, um, how China addresses those issues in an operational way, in a diplomatic way, um, can have signals for Taiwan of a more negative sort. Um, if um, the previous foreign minister uh, in a meeting with ASEAN colleagues says, China's a big country, you're small countries, um, that makes an impression. Um, and I guess the implication for some Taiwan people at least would be if China is going to behave in a bullying fashion towards them, um, they could do it towards us. Um, so it's a mixed picture. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. This is a question related very closely to what Carl asked. Can you introduce yourself? Um, uh, Martin Rivlin, Columbia, and CUNY. Um, you suggested that there's generational change among the Taiwan born. Um, part of the population. So I'm wondering, does this imply to you that this would weaken DPP um, connections to the Japanese right in terms of, um, um, I'm particularly thinking of if Ishihara or someone in Japan poses provocative things again in terms of the islands, how do you see this possible? Um, I think it could. Um, I, 
you probably know that um, Taiwanese um, have, uh, the native Taiwanese have a kind of nostalgic view of Japan, especially the older ones. Um, and that's probably because of the way they were treated under the Kuomintang in the bad old years. Um, the, but um, I think that the generational change uh, has implications uh, here as well, uh, because um, younger Taiwanese understand that um, Taiwan's economic future lies with the mainland. They may not like that 100 percent, but uh, I think there's an understanding that um, to get ahead in life, uh, they'll probably have to work on the mainland um, from time to time. And um, so um, the noises from the, the far right in Japan really don't resonate with what's important uh, for these folks. Uh, Frank, and then I'll come back here. Three particular questions on the Diaoyutai issue. Yes. Uh, first, uh, you only get one, Frank. You know our rule. Okay, Frank Hale, <laughs> United States China Exchanges. Um, first, what is uh, popular public, public opinion uh, on uh, to whom does uh, the Diaoyutai and Kapu Islands belong? Second, what is the official position of the government, Maingo's uh, position? And um, third, what is the scholarly consensus on Taiwan about the origins of the issue, which goes, of course, to the question of to whom does it belong? Um, the, the position of the government of the Republic of China is that the islands belong to China. Uh, the only um, significant exception to that point of view is probably former President Li Donghui, who's basically taken uh, Japan's side in that. Um, I think the um, scholarly opinion um, is sort of varied. Um, you know, there are lots of different facts that you can pick and choose uh, to make your point. Uh, the, um, there's probably a, a, a breakdown in the spectrum um, between the so-called deep blue people who uh, um, feel very strongly that this is uh, something that uh, Taiwan needs to take very seriously and whereas on the, the green side, the DPP side, um, there's a feeling that our relations with Japan are important enough uh, in dealing with the problem of China that we shouldn't make this uh, um, such a serious thing. Uh, there are a couple of scholars um, on Taiwan who have done some really good work um, on this issue and have gone into the archives and um, you know, have uh, um, a good case that they've developed. Um, ben? Uh, public opinion, the third part. Um, uh, I don't know of any serious polling. I, mean, I, I think a lot of this is driven by the media and, um, you know, the way they're playing the issue. Um, and um, in a somewhat nationalistic way. Okay, Ben, and then we'll go back here. Okay. I'm wondering what the, um, the ben, uh, ben Moore architect, mm -hmm. I'm wondering what the, once you get beyond the argument itself about Taiwan, which has been going on for fears, what is Taiwan to the mainland? I mean, it's, 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 it's a point of pride, it's a pot of gold, it's a thorn in the side. Is it also kind of a canary, or is it rather, you know, how, how, how do Chinese people think about some things? Is it a laboratory for a different Chinese way of life? Is it a bad example of the wrong Chinese way of life? How do you sense that people on the mainland really view Taiwan? Well, um, there are a lot of people on the mainland, and they have a lot of different views, uh, so it's probably all of the above. Um, 
I, uh, there was a uh, Chinese blogger, famous Chinese blogger, who visited Taiwan um, uh, last year, around this time. And one of the things he wrote about his trip, he said, thank you for Taiwan for preserving traditional Chinese culture, because um, it's been destroyed where I live. Um, the, uh, but a, a couple of additional points. I think there is the view that um, a divided country can't be a great power. And until uh, Taiwan has returned to the embrace of the motherland, uh, we're not going to be taken seriously in the world. Um, I think that's an important one. Uh, there is um, another line of argument that um, is discussed most clearly by the late Alan Walkman, uh, who taught at uh, the Fletcher School and was a really good scholar. Um, he believes that there is a, a long tradition of, of uh, Chinese strategists viewing Taiwan as a um, uh, strategically important uh, piece of territory. Um, Chiang Kai-shek um, called it one of China's fortresses. And unless the government of China holds Taiwan, uh, it's on the defensive. And I think that's, that's important. So right here. Yeah. Um, Bill Armbruster, freelance journalist. You've used the phrase Republic of China quite a few times. Mm -hmm. How commonly is that used uh, over there? And uh, is it used more commonly now than, say, during uh, the presidency of Chen Shui-bian? Also, does uh, Ma Yingzhou, does he have a two-term limit, or could he seek re-election? Um, President Ma has, uh, has a two-term limit. Um, he will leave office uh, a fairly young man. Um, I think the Republic of China is very important for members of the Kuomintang and the leaders of the Kuomintang. Um, President Ma, on the night, uh, it was in January when it was clear he was going to be reelected, said, among other things, I will safeguard the sovereignty of the Republic of China with my life. I mean, that, uh, he takes it very seriously. Um, for um, people in the DPP, um, um, they, first of all, uh, view the Republic of China in historical terms. It was the ROC that, that they feel treated them so badly from about 1946 to um, 1986. Um, the most they are willing to concede is that it is the um, current name of, uh, of Taiwan. Uh, it also happens to be the name in the Constitution. Um, but, and uh, I think there could be some deeper thinking about um, what the ROC is and, and what it means to say you're going to safeguard its sovereignty. I think that's some homework that Taiwan has to do for itself. So the gentleman next to Bill. Yes. Yes, hello there. Identify yourself. Dennis Yang. Mm-hmm. Uh, NYU. Yes. yes. Is that a question about uh, the role of the diaspora, for instance? Um, in the last decade or so, there's been a steady increase in the number of mainland students yes. who migrate here, mm -hmm. as well as others who, who live here in America. And correspondingly, there's been a decrease in the numbers from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So what, what roles, if any, do you see these flows playing in Construction, the sort of, and the changes that have occurred or will occur in U.S. China Taiwan relations. And can I just add to that, Richard? The, the decrease in the number of Taiwanese who had come here and were staying, and now who have gone back to Taiwan. Okay. So the reduced number of Taiwanese students who come here and go back. 
Um, I think I mean this is a, an area that um, is really a gold mine for a good research project uh, <laughs> because uh, um, it's very important to know and, and also very hard to know what the impact of of Taiwan is on um, young people who go there and spend time in Taiwan universities. Um, the tourist experience is a pretty short term and uh, perhaps ephemeral one. Uh, I think um, President Ma and his government is betting that uh, the more uh, PRC <coughs> students uh, that study in um, Taiwan universities, the better for Taiwan's image um, on the mainland. Um, similarly, uh, a lot of Taiwan people have had a um, um, uh, experiences living and working on the mainland. Um, what conclusions they draw about the nature of their cousins um, is uh, very useful, or it would be very important. Um, the diaspora also um, comes into play at election time. Uh, because Taiwan doesn't have absentee balloting. And um, so the, um, um, at election time, uh, there are a lot of uh, Taiwanese Americans who find a way to go back so that they can vote. Um, uh, their Taiwan businessmen on the mainland uh, jam the airplanes to get back to Taiwan and vote. Um, it's a real bonanza for tour travel agents. Um, as far as Jan's uh, question is concerned, um, uh, the, a good number of the Taiwanese, Taiwanese who came here um, from the 1950s on, um, they stayed for political reasons and um, uh, some of them went back uh, once the political system opened up. and. Uh, um, uh, they ran for office. Uh, some of them are friends of mine who are in the legislature. Um, uh, you no longer have the political motivation for staying. Um, I guess the more concerning um, aspect of the decline in Taiwan people studying here is what does that do for Taiwan's competitiveness uh, economically? Um, it was very important as a driver for Taiwan's development and prosperity that you had people who had been trained here and, and then went back and, and contributed. And um, um, so to, to some extent, uh, Taiwan is hurting itself by not sending more people here. The, I, I'm sorry to say we have reached um, Seven o'clock. I know we have a lot of hands still up. Let me just say, number one, the book is outside. It is available for sale, and Richard is willing to sign it. So you will get a signed copy for the low price of twenty-five dollars. And um, you know, this has been terrific. And I thank you. Sure. And um, you know, please join me in thanking Richard. Um, thank you very much.